All right, I think we're live, gentlemen. Uh, to all the people that have uh, come out to say hello uh, today, um, it's great to see you, and I wish I could see more of you. I can see your, your smiling faces like we do in a happy hour, but this is our, our webinar series. So um, we can't see anybody's lovely faces, but the five of us here looking at, <laughs> and three, four, three of us have hats on, and two of us didn't get the memo. So I apologize. I guess you guys need to send us a Fuji hat, or a oh, Fuji film hat. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Right on it. <laughs> so I'm gonna, my name is Dave Gallagher. I own Caption Integration. I want to start talking a little bit about who we are as a, as a company here, and then we'll get into to, uh, everybody else that's here with us. And so um, if you're not familiar with, with Caption Integration, uh, my company was started in 2004. We're on, now in our 16th year based in Atlanta. Uh, we are a small family owned business and uh, have a great reputation about uh, really caring about the customer with strong knowledge of, of the product and, and constantly want to learn. Uh, we also own uh, Shopflow Studio Product Production Management Software. That is a secondary company. Um, and then uh, I also, if it's not here, uh, we also own Cambo USA uh, as well. Uh, who really are we from the reputation that we started? Well, um, my background was large format. Uh, I started with Cnar Braun right out of college in 1991, and I've always been, I've always been focused on the high end, the the highest resolution, uh, the best camera gear. I was a camera gear nerd uh, in college, and it just continued when I, I started my own business. And so we really have been known as uh, for a long time as the leader in medium format. And so we've been phase one partner of the year three times. Uh, we sell uh, Hasselblad products. And of course, here to, today, we're here to invite the Fuji film guys in and pick their brains for a little bit. But before we get there, I just want to go over uh, one thing that's a, just a really um, important to me when it comes to quality. I feel like all of us in, in consumerism uh, and uh, in business sometimes are at this race to the bottom. Right? We want to lower our expectations. We want a lower quality, win a lower price, and just to try to get to that volume business. That's not who we are uh, in Race to the Bond. We always want to deal with the highest quality product and with the highest expectations of a company and uh, of our product support and knowledge and who we are as a company. And so I am going to then escape. Um, I want to let everybody know uh, you can ans ask questions um, and put in the questions on the side. I'm going to uh, ask the rest of the presenters questions while I hand it over to them. Um, but if you can see us now, uh, there is Brad Kay. I'll introduce Brad as, as our, our technical support specialist. But honestly, Brad, so much more than that to us. Brad, do you want to say hello and, and uh, give a little bit of your background? Hey, I'm, I'm Brad. Um, I've been a commercial photographer for more than 30 years. So within my role at Capture Integration uh, for the last five years and as a client for the seven years before that, um, I like to play with gear and I, I get to play with the gear in real world situations. So it gives me the, uh, the traction to recommend uh, between brands and, and figure out what the best fit is for anything. And, and I also run uh, the rental department and our demo fleet. So uh, I keep our GFX uh, bodies pretty busy and uh, we've got the full complement of lenses. And so I get to play with all that gear too. And so it's interesting uh, from the standpoint of seeing different manufacturers take different approaches to what is essentially the same thing. It, it's a camera, it does, it does one thing once you get through all the stuff and the Fuji cameras do that one thing quite well. The image quality is, is so wonderful. Um, so it's, uh, we, we were happy to bring it into uh, our fold at Capture Integration. Wonderful. And that brings us to Mr. Gordon. Uh, John Gordon is our sales specialist, um, but I'm going to let John introduce himself and, and tell a little bit about himself. John, you have the floor. Oh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm the Southeast Regional Manager for Fujifilm um, for retail and I also in, in charge of the cruise line business as well. I've uh, been in the photo industry for well over 30 years. I don't want to add any more years to that, but uh, a long time. And I started out because of the love of photography, obviously, and that's why I'm still here doing it. I, I have a passion for photography and 
wish I had more time to um, to uh, express that passion. So, but uh, it's really about uh, our tech guys today. We got uh, two experts that are going to be doing most of the talking today: Chris Christopher Gilbert and John Haggerty. Um, I'll start off with Christopher. Go ahead and, and, and tell us a little bit about yourself and what uh, what's going on. Hey guys, uh, Christopher Gilbert. I uh, worked for Fujifilm and a half for the last two and a half years. Uh, I feel a little embarrassed to say that uh, probably everyone, at least on the panel side, has been here a little bit longer than I have, so I'm very much a pup in the industry. Uh, started off maybe about 18 years ago. I uh, worked as a portrait photographer as well as a park ranger, and that really made me fall in love with landscape photography. Uh, beyond that, I worked at a retail store for roughly eight years before I moved here. Like everybody else, I'm very much a gear junkie, love cameras, love shooting. You know, pretty much it is the way that I can express myself and kind of vent. And especially right now in 2020, I sure need a lot of that. Uh, but, you know, being a product technical specialist, I'm here to answer any questions that you have. And the main thing is just to talk shop. I mean, this is not meant to be intimidating by any means whatsoever. We're just going to talk about gear for a little bit, hopefully answer your questions and, uh, then have a great weekend. Uh, John, what about you? Well, thanks, Christopher. Um, thanks for having us here, everybody. Um, for yours, I'm John Haggerty. I've been in the photo industry since 1991 um, with Fujifilm, and I've bounced around for a little while. I've been in this current position for about five and a half years. Um, Christopher and I are looking forward to talking to you about the GFX 100. Um, for those of you who are on this call now who currently own a GFX 100, thank you. Um, for you, those uh, who are on the fence or hopefully after this presentation, we could uh, push you over the fence and get you across the finish line. And with that, um, Christopher is going to be doing most of the presentation. I'll be chiming in as again, if you have any questions, um, you can put it in on the chat and I will try to answer them the best I can. I'm sure between Christopher and I, we could probably handle most of it. And all I could say is if I don't know the answer, I could find out. So again. That's it for me. <laughs> well, uh, if that's the case, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Uh, let me go ahead and get started. And let me look over here real quick. People can see my screen. Boom. So do we see my screen right here that has my name and your, John's name? We see your full screen. Ah, how about now? Looks great. Looks Perfect. Good. All right. So, John Haggerty and myself, like we said, we're both product technical specialists. If you care to follow me on Instagram, I do post maybe once every six years. Uh, I don't really care about social media anymore. I do photography for myself, and I found that interacting with people on a face-to-face -face basis made more sense than on the web and social media. Uh, you can find me on fujifilm-x.com. I have written about four or five articles for them. Uh, it's pretty much uh, completely changed my job in terms of how I interact with people with COVID. So both John and I were very much people uh, persons. And now sitting behind a screen like this has changed so much of our jobs. And we're learning along just the same as everybody else. So if I look a little Zoom fatigued, that's why. <clears throat> and so I'm going to skip this slide real quick just so we can get to the meat and potatoes. We already done the introduction. We don't need to go into it again. Uh, so our, our jobs are basically, we don't sell anything. Our jobs are to help you and to educate you about the products. And so that could mean a couple of things. It could be this presentation, or we do have other options as well. And I'm gonna go into that on the next slide. And so if you haven't been to our website before, I highly recommend it. And so that's where you're gonna get, obviously all the product information, right? Well, if you have questions specifically about your GFX 100 and you want to know how to operate it, you want to know a better alternative in terms of how to get to different functions, all you got to do is go to our website. We have free tech time right there. It costs absolutely nothing to you. It's not shared with anybody else. It's one-on-one -on -one with either myself, John, Lewis, or Matthew. And so that's basically held to three days a week. And so by far it has been the best use of my time, I, like I said, I love talking to people and it's a great way to problem solve if you get into that nitty gritty and you need some help. 
Is there anybody else doing this today on the free one-on-one -on -one tech support like that? Um, I think a couple uh, companies tried to do it. And I think yeah. we might be the few ones that are left, if not the only one left. I that's think true. right now we are the only one that's still doing it. So that's great. And so yeah. I, I mean, I, I find it was a great resource. And so as far as the overview, what we're going to cover today, you can obviously see on the screen here, we're going to go into the system. I'm going to talk a little bit, I mean, briefly, like two or three slides about what makes the camera different in terms of comparative to some of our other systems, X-Series, the 50R and 50S. We're going to go to color. Then we're going to go into GFX 100. And I did get some of your questions beforehand, so I'm going to try to tackle those as I talk. Uh, but keep in mind, there's a lot of information that you guys requested. So between my between John and myself, we'll hopefully answer any questions that you have. Then we're going to go into some customization. I know some people had some questions about autofocus mode, specifically in continuous, and we'll go over that as far as customizations of the camera itself. And finally, last but not least, spend the last five or six minutes going into workflow. And so after that, we'll kind of have an open forum, basically. 15 to 25 minutes to answer your questions. Unfortunately, you'll have to see our faces a little bit larger than just this screen, but you'll see it. So, obviously we have a history in cameras, and when we launched the X100, we tried to emulate that was what was in our previous cameras, meaning controls exactly where you wanted them to be. Nothing had to be overly complicated, right? And so we had everything on the exterior of the camera. These are all hard dials coming all the way back from the, you know, my favorite camera that we made, you know, the GSW 690 version three, absolutely love the camera. All the controls are on the outside. So when we introduced the X series camera, we wanted the same thing. And as soon as we introduced the GFX lineup, the 50R and 50S, we wanted that as well. But when we released the GFX 100, it's a completely different platform because of the expectations from you, as far as the audience. You want customization to the nth degree. You don't want any sort of words on any sort of buttons because you want to make the camera yours rather than having to change your style to the camera, if that makes sense. And so we'll get into that. I'll show you all the different customizations that you have. I'll tell you about what I call the three tiers of customization and show you how to make it so you don't have to dive into a menu, if that makes sense. And so another thing is that continuity across platform. You know, we didn't have the GFX series up until roughly three years ago. And so people that came from the X series cameras that were wanting more, we wanted to emulate that entire style. And so you're gonna have identical submenus, you're gonna have identical displays, and this is gonna be the same on the GFX 100. It might be in a different place because there's more options, but in terms of how you interact with the camera within the menu, there is no difference. They might be placed slightly different, but in terms of finding it, it should be somewhat intuitive as you get more and more used to said camera. I don't think we need to introduce our film stock by any means. Uh, you know, I'm a big Belvia person, being a landscape guy. Belvia, Provia, very much a positive film type person. And that's gonna be the same within all of our cameras. These are emulating our film stock to the nth degree. So if you love Belvia, it's going to look like Belvia. You like Astia, it's going to look like Astia. And obviously, yes, these are JPEGs in camera. And I know once you get to the GFX 100, your expectations are, I want to shoot it in RAW. I want to unlock its capability right then and there. And I want to be able to edit it to the nth degree. And that's all fine and good. But I also want a product that I can show a customer and have them see that right off the camera and be excited about what they look like. And I want to make sure that their color depth and tonality is exactly how they want to appear. And that's what we're proud of. We have that color accuracy within our systems. And so let's talk about the camera that you all came here to talk about. So I'm going to list some specs. You guys probably know most of it already. So it's a 102 megapixel camera, 425 autofocus points. It has IBIS built into it, five and a half stops with some lenses. Yes, it is a focal plane shutter. It is not a leaf shutter. The reason for this is you have the capability of adapting lenses on there. We do have four by five adapters. We also have adapters that work with leaf shutter lenses, and we'll talk about that in the next couple of slides. Um, but the focal plane shutter really gave us that flexibility. It also kept lens prices down quite a bit too. So 
yes, the can, this can shoot 16-bit color. It is not a 14-bit sensor in a 16-bit color space. It is true 16-bit color. And so it is also a viable video camera as well. And so the reason why I showed you the X-Series slides in the previous uh, couple slides is because we already have that expertise in terms of how to make the camera operate fast enough and how to use it appropriately without overheating. And so, yes, this has 4K capability up to 30 frames a second. Yes, it's 10-bit 422 using an external recorder. And that overall size of the sensor, once you drop into that 16 by 9 or 17 by 9 aspect ratio, is much bigger than almost anything else out there. I can only think of maybe one or two other sensors. And so that viewfinder, almost 6 million pixels. There's only one other viewfinder that's a little bit larger now. And last but not least, you have that choice of 16-bit versus 14-bit RAW, as well as shooting JPEG as you so choose. And so you can see on the exterior of the camera, we have more than just one LCD display. It's basically like liquid ink. You have a sub-monitor on the top and a rear sub-monitor, right? These can show the information that you want it to appear. More so on the rear sub-monitor than the top sub-monitor, and this will make sense once I explain it. So... This top sub-monitor basically is gonna to try to emulate what you saw on our other X-Series cameras. So you do have the option for seeing the rotary dials for ISO as well as shutter speed. If you don't care about any sort of that, you just want the standard information, you'd have the capability of putting basically almost anything you want on there. And so you also have the capability of getting your histogram readout but as we all know, keep in mind that readout is based off your JPEG engine. It is not a raw readout, but there is ways to get around that. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. On that rear sub monitor, once again, you can program everything that you want on there. And for me, as far as my shooting style, less is more. And so when I'm looking at my screen, I have one autofocus box and that's it. Everything else is on that rear sub monitor. That's going to be down here on the back side of the camera, as you can see right here. So that's where I'm having aperture, shutter speed, ISO, white balance, all that kind of stuff. And so for me, now I can see everything on the screen and still have the capability to change it to a digital readout if I want to, meaning do I want to throw up a live view histogram on there? Do I want an RGB histogram? I have so much stuff that I can put on there if I really want to do that. So it's not like I'm stuck with, you know, just a small amount of information at the bottom of the screen. This is full flexibility. Again, we're not trying to replace any sort of format. You know, yes, there's larger sensors out there. There's smaller sensors out there. Where we excel at is that we now have a sensor that's roughly 60% larger than a 35 millimeter negative. So not quite up there with phase, but we get the flexibility and the readout speed. So if you're a phase user and you're looking for something for travel and you don't want to have any sort of qualms as far as image quality and giving that up, this could be a system for you. So that's basically the end of my sales pitch. And that's just me being passionate about this camera because I was looking forward to it for a very long time coming from the 50S. So this physical dimensions of the camera itself is fairly small. You know, if you look right here, you got six by six by four, essentially. You're roughly close to the same size as a D5, D6, you know, one DX, Mark II, Mark III, whatever. And so it's going to house two batteries, roughly have a CEPA rating of about 800 shots or so. This will also do trickle charging. So you can plug in any sort of power bank as long as it supports trickle charging and you're able to operate the camera or charge the battery from that as well. And that's basically why I have it here. And so once you go into 16-bit raw files, you're looking at about 400 megabytes per file. And so... This is a little bit different cameras. In fact, our GFX series is a little bit different from our X series in terms of sensor setup. These aren't X trans sensors. It's not a six by six pattern. It's a two by two pattern. It's a Bayer sensor, what everyone's used to. So there's going to be no issues in terms of workflow. You're not going to have to make any sort of special transitions in terms of having plugins. This is going to naturally fall within the workflow that you're used to already. And so, as far as ruggedization, you know, I sh probably shouldn't say this, but when I first started with Fujifilm, uh, I had the X-Pro2, which is our crop sensor camera, and I had a, a, a weather-sealed lens, and I accidentally had a couple beers, left the camera outside for eight hours in a torrential downpour, and I'm not kidding, and I woke up the next day, pretty much, you know, I 
choked almost because I had just started that job and I wiped it off and it was fine. And so in terms of ruggedization, I have no issues with this system. And so you're gonna get a magnesium alloy body, that's what you see right here. You're getting 95 points of weather sealing, so everything is gasketed, right? Plus, you have an additional, uh, basically, uh, unit for the IBIS unit, as well as the sensor itself. So you got two pieces of magnesium alloy, body, as well as the sensor inside, housing that IBIS unit. Also, in order to handle that shutter shot, because as we know, the higher the resolution of the cameras, the more probability you have introducing shutter shock. And obviously beforehand, medium format was really meant for tripods, right? Well, not necessarily. You know, with this setup using the 250 lens that we have out right now, I'm getting like eighth of a second, fourth of a second exposures at a 200 millimeter equivalent in 35 millimeter terms. I mean, that's pretty crazy. You're getting an eighth of a second at a 250th fo focal length. Yes, yes I am, and it's repeatable. That's tremendous. And so with this, obviously you're gonna have to change how you shoot. You're gonna hold your breath, you're gonna tuck in your arms, and you're gonna get about 40% capture rate. But beforehand, was that possible? I don't think so. And so this gives you the opportunity to get off that tripod if you so choose. I'm still a tripod guy, I bring it wherever I go, it can be very annoying, but you're not restricted to it, right? And that's kind of the luxury of this base system. So let's look inside the viewfinder real quick. Like I said beforehand, it's over 5 million dots. You have all this crap right here that you could put on there, right? I could fill this entire screen with information, but the luxury is you don't have to. Put whatever you want in. And if you want an RGB histogram, and that's basically it, if you want just your autofocus points, that's it. If you just want to care about your film simulation and what white balance you're using, you can do that as well. All this down here can be illustrated and basically put on the screen. Also, I put this on here is you're not restricted to either a center weighted autofocus box or a left and right. You have 425 autofocus points that you can basically put wherever you want. You know, you have over 90% coverage of the sensor. It's phase detection, it's not contrast detection. So you're not gonna get that hunting that you're used to potentially on some of our 50R and 50S as soon as that light gets a little bit dim. You know, I've never had this struggle unless it was a mistake caused by me. You know, I'm pointing at a subject with no contrast whatsoever. It's completely white or completely black. If I make it the autofocus point large enough, it's gonna get it. So let's go over autofocus in terms of continuous autofocus types. You know, we got this question beforehand, how do I make the camera work for me when I'm capturing fast subjects? You know, I have a few friends that are actually shooting this for wildlife, which blows my mind because we don't really have a very long lens, but they're using that resolution in order to hand that compensation in terms of not having that focal length that goes past 250 millimeters, including that teleconverter. And so we're borrowing the same autofocus system from our X-Series cameras. And so you're gonna have six different types that you can actually change it to, five of which that we've already programmed into it. And it's gonna change various options within this system. So if we look right here, we should have three options, right? Tracking sensitivity, speed of tracking, as well as the zone. And so each one of these different options, the first five, are basically varying these, and it's giving you a predefined situation, right? So multi-purpose. So basically, your speed of tracking in terms of sensitivity as well as the speed itself, it's going to vary. So let's look down here. Tracking sensitivity, the parameter determines how long the camera waits to switch focus when an object enters the frame. So we have that. So the speed of, of sensitivity, that's how fast it's going to transition. And last but not least is going to be that overall zone. Where within the viewfinder it's going to transition from? Is it going to ignore an object or is it going to stick with that object? Do you want it to stay within a certain tracking area or you do want it to be flexible throughout the other tracking areas? And so this will make sense once I go through these. Like I said beforehand, as I change and click this button, you should see these change. So multi-purpose is going to basically be middle of the road sensitivity, but very slow in terms of transition going from one subject to another uh, when it identifies that subject because it's color-based, right? 
there's object rent, you know, there's basically you can recognize objects based on color. Let's go to the next one. So this one is going to be ignore obstacles. So it's going to basically say, hey, I'm going to follow that subject within the center of the frame. I'm going to ignore obstacles that are in the front. So it's going to ignore basically this front zone. And it's going to pay more attention to the sensitivity of that subject moving. So let's go to the next one. Accelerating, decelerating subjects. Fast moving subjects needs to compensate more dramatically. So though even though my sensitivity might stay the same in terms of tracking, the speed of which it transition needs to be much higher. And that's where you see this transition right here. Subtly appearing subjects, middle of the road, it's looking for everything closest to the camera. So it's ignoring zones that are a little bit further beyond that. Just like we know whatever is closest to the camera within that box is gonna be most in focus. And we do have options to change that just a little bit. And that's why it gives you these options down here. Once we get to this last one, it will make more sense. Erratically moving subjects. You know, I will be honest, this is probably what I keep mine on the most. And basically because I never know what I'm gonna be doing. And this covers most of my bases. You know, I'm very much not so much an AFC guy, but when I am AFC, I'm basically reliant on the fifth one as well as the second one. And that's gonna be for that accelerating, decelerating subjects. So let's look at these options. Sensitivity as far as tracking has been increased. The speed of which it transition has been increased. And it's gonna fluctuate between zones, meaning closest, middle, and furthest from the camera. It's doing all of this for you. So keep in mind, if you are not changing this, it might not react the way that you want it to. And that's why you might question the autofocus of the system. It's because you, we haven't told it what to do appropriately, right? And that's why, you know, Canon 1DX, Nikon D5, anything like that, there are ways to customize said system, but now we have that in a medium format camera. And so if you don't care about the first five, you also have the capability of customizing your own. What if you want to turn everything to 11? I want tracking sensitivity all the way up, speed of tracking all the way up. I want the zones to change from close to far. You can do that. I don't know why, but you'd have that option. We want to give you the potential, again, to make the camera your own. And so that was how the camera reacts either by back button focus or by shutter button focus were in AFC. So in determining where your camera actually grabs that focus, you have the capability of going from one single point up to the largest point, which is wide, wide slash tracking. And so as you see here, the single point will be unlocked to its smallest potential if you go into the AF slash MF area, and there should be an option called number of focus points. If it says 117 or 119, you haven't unlocked it yet. But before you do that, keep in mind, you're gonna have to be on the single point option here. And so you can get to this a couple ways. Easiest way, if you're already an owner of the camera, get used to that Q button. We'll talk about that in a little bit. That's gonna be your best friend. But let's go through these options real quick. So single point, we already know what that is. We can shrink or expand it up to nine points. Once you go past that, you are now into zone. We can shrink and expand zone. Once we expand it up to a certain point, we're now in wide. That's using the entirety of the frame. And so there's a reason why they call it wide slash tracking rather than just wide or just tracking because it Chris, acts differently depending on how you have your autofocus mode set to. Chris, I mean, I'm going to ask you some questions that are coming up while you're in that section so that we don't miss them. And so that we actually have see three right in a row. Uh, and okay. so... It, it was, but where, how do I adjust the AF uh, sets? And so can you adjust those yeah. five sets? Yeah, absolutely. So we're gonna do a plug and play afterwards. John, how does that yeah. sound? Yeah, yeah, but it's, yeah, we could do so that at basically the end. Sure. What it is, is if you go and hit the menu OK button, there should be an option within that called AF slash MF. That's everything to do with autofocus slash manual focus. And so you should see something within that menu. If I remember correctly, it should be either on the last part of the first page or the first part of the second page. And that's all how you get to it within the menu itself. You also have the capability of customizing it to a function button or to your quick menu. Yeah. One of the two. I use the function button most of the time myself. 
personal. Right. I don't I don't use the Q fun I use functions buttons more than a Q function, but and that's just a personal thing with me. I'm gonna I'm not running away from you guys, I promise. I'm gonna head back here real quick. Yeah. So, so John, John Haggerty, if someone was just shooting a, a simple model, you know, just if they're, let's say they're senior portraits, uh, that's mm -hmm. what they shoot, right? Um, if they were, that's what they did primarily, which one of those five would you, would you use? Well, for something like that, if I was just primarily doing just that, I may just switch to the Q function and, and set up a whole portrait scenario through the Q menu. Um, you could switch, to change film simulations if you wanted to. You could set up your focusing points. You can even name it if you want to in the menu system. And then next time you're in a situation, you just go to Q1 because there's seven different levels of the Q function. And Q1 would be portrait. And you set click and the camera just defaults to all those settings. So you don't have to Dave, constantly were you asking, change uh, it. Were you asking about which uh, continuous autofocus type? I think that's what they were asking at the time of uh, what you were talking about. Well, that really depends. I, I don't mean to rather talk than erratically. <laughs> I don't mean to talk over John, but if I'm in a fixed environment, I'm probably not on AFC. You know, they're static, right? If I'm using this in an environment where I'm following a subject, I'm probably going to be on number five. And let's go back to the last slide. Whoop! There we go. So erratically moving, accelerating, decelerating subjects. And so those subjects are coming toward or away from you, right? If I'm in a fixed environment, I shouldn't have to resort to AFC. You have the option to. I'm probably gonna be AFS in that situation. And I'm probably gonna be choosing a smaller autofocus box, maybe single. You know, we can do face finding. We have that built into it. We have eye detection, all that kind of jazz based off of our X-Series cameras. I like having a little bit more control over that because once you put on face finding detection, it overrides your autofocus points. That makes sense. I did see a question about compatibility with Canon tilt shift lenses, and I happen to have one on my camera. They work great. I only know that the wide ones work great, so 24, 17, they're fine. You get almost the entire tilt and shift. You're not going to go to the nth degree up to like eight or anything like that. Uh, I basically go to plus five or minus five. Works wonders. Can easily handle the resolution, um, but I found that it's not as sharp as our lenses. Mm, I got to tell you, I've been very disappointed. I was very shocked at my testing of, of the, the tilt shift lenses from Canon going to a larger sensor. And that's with your sensor, with your 100, 100 uh, GFX. Um, but lenses I thought were tremendous, right? On the Canon started to fall apart at 100 megapixels. So, so it'll handy, handle 50 all right. Huh? And keep in mind, it's, it's gonna fall apart. These lenses aren't meant to handle over 100 megapixels because Canon doesn't have anything over 100 megapixels. They have 50, right? And that's why they're coming out with new lenses all the time. That's why there's a 16 to 35 version three. That's why there's new 70 to 200. Now they've changed their platform. It's because these lenses came out before there's resolutions like this to push it to that degree. And so you're absolutely right. My 24 tilt shift works great. Yeah, the corners aren't gonna be as good, but obviously I'm throwing a larger image circle and on a 35 millimeter sensor, that's great. When you go up 60%, you're pushing it a little bit too hard. And obviously the more resolution you have, the harder that lens is gonna be pushed. So comparing this to our 23 millimeter, our 23 millimeter is gonna stomp on it. It's meant to handle over hundred megapixels while this isn't. And so, And it sorry. does, yeah. no, that's important. <laughs> and if anybody wants these tests, I'd, I've done the test and have the RAWs. So I can send them RAWs of the 23 versus the 17. Uh, if they'd want to use David Integration.com and I can send you those RAWs. And I'm I'm a big fan of both of those Canon lenses. I mean, I I have them. I spent it with my own money. You know, when they have its their purpose, right? But if I'm going to keep it right over the center and I'm looking for sharpness because I'm assuming it's going to act the same way it did on a Canon body, it's not. Maybe if I drop into 35 millimeter mode, which you're capable on any of our cameras, but obviously we're now we're losing resolution. And that's not the point of a medium format camera. No. So let's talk about, sorry, I get sidetracked quite a bit. So let's talk about autofocus points. So we talked about single, we talked about zone, we talked a little bit about widened tracking and how it's affected based on what autofocus mode you're in. 
And so you see it right up here on the rear of the camera, right next to the eyepiece. We all know S, we all know C, we all know M, right? And so if I'm in S on wide slash tracking, it's using the entire array to try to find whatever's close to the camera and try to stay on it, right? It's gonna use everything. If I go into continuous, it operates differently. This unlocks your tracking feature. So of course you can still use the entire area, but what you should see is a box. Wherever you point that box, press the shutter halfway down, it should lock on that subject. And as long as that subject stays within the frame, it does a pretty decent job. Again, I can't compare it to our crop sensor cameras because you're looking at something that's so much faster as far as reading information. But if you look at it to medium format cameras, this capability is pretty impressive. So let's let's talk about function buttons. And I will be honest, this is what made me move to Fujifilm in the first place. I hate menus, hate them. And so hey, I want to make yeah. What you got? Can you make that? Can you make that full screen again? Do I have to? I'm just mm -hmm. kidding. Yeah. All right, let's go. So with the I'm GFX, gonna, I'm going to interrupt real quick and answer a question, but that's there. Absolutely. Yeah. Someone asked, okay, if the tilt shift lenses don't work, if they're not going to be high enough resolution, what's the option? Today, the option is putting on a view camera. And uh, as a, I am, I'm a view camera guy, right? We can throw this on the back of a of a Cambo Actis or Actis XL, and you use a 23HR lens on the front of it and get full view camera movements, tilt swings, shifts, and, and rise and fall completely on it at, at, with this sensor. Uh, and so there's definitely other options. And, and again, uh, reach out to us if we can help with them. All of them are in our rental, but there are definitely other options. So, and if I rem remember correctly, uh, that adapter for tilt and shift through Hasselblad does work with our H adapter. I'm not gonna lie. Dave, I don't know about you. Do you find it a little finicky? Have you tried uh, you mean that? the, the TS 1.5? Yeah. Yeah, well, you're adding a 50% lens uh, increase and you're adding another optics in between. Yep. Not the best thing. We want it as pure as possible. I'm a purist when it comes to view camera, so I'm not going to say that's the right option. I'm going to agree with Dave. He, he know, also, he knows more about that than I ever will. Uh, so <laughs> I'm going to go with his word. <laughs> so we have over 50 functions to set on the exterior of the camera. Yes, that's a lot of stuff. Yes, it can be overwhelming. So what I try to tell people, if you're picking up this camera or any of our cameras for the first time, all you gotta do is turn the camera on, you're in record mode, right? Press and hold this display back button, and that's gonna bring up this function setting. And you can actually see where the function button is on the camera. And once you go to the right, because anything that has this arrow has then options below that, you can change it. And so you have so many pages worth of that. If I really want that, I can. And for me, I find that I don't need all of those function buttons because I rarely find that I need the function buttons on the vertical grip, but they're there. Again, my shooting style is different than yours, but you want to customize it to how you shoot and not having to customize how you shoot to the camera, if that makes sense. I know I keep reiterating that, but that's really important to me. So let's talk about the three tiers of customization. And so we just talked about function buttons. Obviously there's over 50 options. And so that's the first tier. That's things that you wanna access on a regular basis. You do not wanna to have to go to a menu whatsoever. The next is gonna be your Q menu. That's your quick button. And so it's gonna be very obvious on the rear of the camera. It should be labeled with a Q. And of course, I cropped in on all of these so you can't see it on any of these pictures, but it's gonna be closer to the, the thumb portion right up here, right next to the card slot. And so once I hit that, you get this screen. And so by default, these are gonna be geared mostly toward JPEG options. If that's what you want, awesome. If that's what you don't want, and you wanna make it yours, all you gotta do, just like our function buttons, is you gotta press and hold that Q button for three seconds. And so you're gonna do this in record mode, not in playback mode. And when you do, that brings up the customization menu for that. And you can basically put almost whatever you want here. And so those are things you use infrequently, but you still wanna have access to. And last but not least is my menu. And my menu should be fairly familiar if you're coming from Nikon or Canon. It's basically a menu that you construct with various options. 
And I will be honest, I don't use it the same way it's intended. I use it as a checklist. And the reason why is, do I want to turn IS mode off? Am I shooting JPEGs? Okay, I'm going to go to sRGB color space. Am I shooting RAW? Okay, I'm going to go back to Adobe RGB color space. I use that as a checklist to remind myself all these settings that I want to change. Because being a landscape guy, I want to make sure, am I on mechanical shutter? Am I on electronic front and curtain? I don't want to have to go to a menu to find that. And I find just looking at this, once I hit that menu OK button, makes it much easier. Now, if you want to use this traditionally how it was made, you can put parameters in here that you want to get to that you don't want to have to hunt in the menu. And these are going to be things you use infrequently. And so between all of these, I will be honest, I rarely even have to go to the quick menu. I do everything from the function buttons. But if there are some things like I don't set my continuous autofocus settings to a function button, I set it to the quick menu because I use it less frequently. But if you're a wedding photographer and you rely on that and you want to cycle through the modes quickly, set it to a function button. Once you hit that, it'll instantly bring up those options. Or if you set it to the quick menu, all you got to do is memorize those numbers. And I guarantee within a month or two of using the camera, because having that expectation, you're going to know off the right off the bat, it's just going to be infuriating. But you're going to learn what each one does. And so just like Dave was talking about, we have that four by five adapter. You have that capability, full tilt, full swing. So if you're looking for a true tilt shift lens and you don't want to compromise resolution, you have that avenue. And I know, trust me, I'm that guy too. I want a native tilt shift lens, but that R&D in order to make that happen is a lot. And so this was our alternative as of right now. So as far as native lenses, we have everything from 23 upwards of 250 as far as primes. And for zooms, obviously 32 to 64, 45 to 100, and also you're gonna have the 100 and 200. And so for me and my style of shooting, landscape guy, I use the 23, I use the 45 to 100, and the 100 to 200, that's my kit. But if you're a portrait person, this 110 is our bread and butter. Every company has a system seller, right? This is our system seller. It is incredibly sharp. Yes, you know, F2 might not seem fast, but we're talking medium format, right? And if you want even faster, we already publish our roadmap. We're gonna get an 80 millimeter 1.7 within the year. So you're gonna get that faster glass. Now, if you're trying to use older lenses, Keep in mind, you're pushing those lenses to the nth degree, so they might not handle the resolution, but again, depends on your medium. So if I'm just sharing for you know Facebook or something like that with a medium format camera, it's probably not gonna matter. If I'm making below a 20 by 30, you might not see the difference. You know, But as I enlarge, these lenses get pushed more and more, and we do have focus aids for manual focus glass. They're built into it. We do have the kind of split prism, it's electronic. We do have focus peaking. We do have dual display where you see the whole thing and have a magnification wherever your autofocus point is. That's all there. And so I find that, yes, some of the Canon lenses work well, but I'm having harder and harder times finding lenses that will resolve the overall resolution of the camera. Now, if I drop down to the 50, that's probably not as big of a deal. I have some, you know, some smaller lenses Surprisingly enough, M-mount lenses that will cover this sensor, depending on field of view, obviously. And 50 megapixels doesn't push that lens as much as 100. And so just keep that in mind when you're searching for that lens that is not currently in our lineup, that you might have to reduce your overall image size to compensate for that. So H-mount adapter. We made quite a bit of H lenses. And so we have this adapter right here. It does give you leaf shutter support. If you're trying to get that set up for flash, it's not going to be the full shutter speed range. It's only up to 1 800th of a second. You have full focal plane shutter right here. If I remember correctly, um, our sync speed is a little on the lower side. So, John, I don't know if you remember. I think it's 1 125th. I can't yeah, remember. It is. Yeah. Perfect. Mm -hmm. And so, yes. It's not going to be as fast as the leaf shutter lenses like you find on, you know, the new Hasi or something like that. But again, that costs, that makes your lens costs go up as a byproduct of that. 
Yes, there are ways around that. You do have high speed sync, you do have high sync, those are all options. And so you have the capability of just adapting these right on there, no autofocus whatsoever, strictly manual. There is a button on the side to go from focal plane shutter to leaf shutter in the lens. And don't forget, you still have the electronic shutter up to 1 16,000th of a second, but that does not work with flash. And so if you're trying to equate this to a 35 millimeter sensor, there's your formula right there. If you're gonna to try to equate it to a phase one, there's your formula right there as far as getting a similar field of view. And so let's talk about pro services a little bit before we go into uh, workflow. How am I doing on time? Not too shabby, I talk a lot. Doing great, doing yeah. great. So I know 399 might seem like a lot, but you gotta factor in this isn't a $5,000 camera, you know, repairs are going to be a little bit higher. And I was trying to compare and contrast some of the other manufacturers. And yes, there are some that have less, but you got to look at the discount you get on repairs. Very few have 30% off. A lot of them are 10% off, 20% off. So that's obviously going to increase your annual cost. But this is going to give you full support, expedited repairs, rental capability, all you have to do is purchase $3,000 or more, which you've already done threefold if you own this camera without a lens. Also, you have that tech time, use it to your advantage. And so it's fallen off a little bit for us, but if you have specific questions, you can call the support number. You're gonna get a hold of a real life person. You're not gonna go through an entire computer program trying to yell into it. You know, I'm trying to get the claims. It's just gonna be a person on the other side. Next, through our website, just how I found this information, we got the firmware updates there that we're all known for. So we're gonna continuously improve our cameras. So the 50R and 50S, those got a radically new firmware update in version two, improving low light autofocus, the readout speed for autofocus. You're getting new film simulations. Some people don't care about that, but I'm a sucker for classic and Hague. We're going to continue to I support film simulations. Yeah. <laughs> right? I love film simulations, yeah. And so this is also where you're going to get software too. And we'll talk about that in a little bit, which is basically right here. <laughs> and so do we have full Capture One support? Yes. Do we have live view capability? Yes. Now I pulled this off of Capture One's website, and my only complaint about it is Xtrans to DNG is not supported. Well, none of these are X-Trans sensors. All these are Bayer sensors. So you're not gonna have any issues whatsoever, like I said beforehand, as far as integrating it into your current workflow. There's no special way around it in order to increase sharpness with an X-Trans sensor that people assume. Fairly easily use. And so this is gonna be integrated with almost anything else. Capture One, Lightroom, Luminar, XRAW Studio, if you're using our platform, obviously Photoshop, DxO Photo Lab. I don't know if anyone's still using that. And so I haven't had to change my style in terms of editing. I resorted back to Lightroom, unfortunately. Capture One is a great program, but it's better for tethering. For me in cataloging, Lightroom made more sense. I'm not a big fan of the Adobe algorithm as far as demosaicing the information from the sensor but it gets me close to what Capture One is capable of. And so you're not gonna have any sort of issue if you use something else, you're not gonna have to change your style. And so I'm gonna be quiet in just a second, I promise guys, but again, if you have any questions as far as our pro services, our phone number is here. If you have any sort of questions as far as professional help, this is the 1-800 number. You can talk to Steve, Steve, Bob, Dan, or Bruno. They're right there in the repair department if you have an issue. And again, I'm gonna reiterate this, use that tech time. It's now restricted to three days a week, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, but that's at no cost to you and it's about your specific problem. So I'm gonna exit out this screen share real quick and we're gonna open this up to any sort of questions that you have. Uh, and I have not looked at the chat, so what do we got? And now everybody can, can make our faces look bigger so you can see the bad haircut that I need badly right now. <laughs> right, we actually, little, there we go. We've covered, a, we've covered most of them. I tried to get them in there. There's one uh, by Chris at the end is, can you cover manual focus assist for, for maybe uh, putting a manual lens in or an old vintage lens in? So as far as manual focus assist and what I personally like is I like using the dual display. 
And so basically what you're going to get is you're going to get a large box and a smaller box on the right or left hand side. You can program it to either one, whatever you want. And so wherever you put your single point, it's going to be magnified right there. If you're using native lenses, don't forget we have the built-in distance scale right there that you can easily set up. But when it comes to adapting lenses, it really depends whether you have electronic contacts or not. If it's a dummy lens with a dummy adapter, meaning no electronic contacts, contacts you're really going to be reliant on, in my opinion, the dual's display. Because you can try to use focus peaking, but once again, this is a 100 megapixel sensor. It's, you've got to go 100% on the rear of the screen to see if you got focus. Even at 75%, it's still going to look sharp. So that's why I don't trust it too much. And so yeah. that's why so, I uh, shift that to the bottom right-hand corner. What yeah, you got, John? Let me, let me get your opinion on this then. What about the, um, and I use this sometimes on the GFX, yeah. the autofocus plus manual focus with peaking. What's huh? your view on that? Because I, I find when I do, and you do a lot more landscaping than I do, um, you know, I use the autofocus plus MF, which you can set up in the menu. You just press the shutter halfway down and just tweak the focusing a little bit, and then your focus peaking kicks. And it just kind of, to me, just right. tweaks the sharpening a little bit. Ideal for, for landscape work. I just, oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, if you're yeah. using our native lenses, I will be honest, guys, I don't autofocus. I'm manually yeah. focusing. And there's a distance scale built into the camera that's going to fluctuate depending on what lens you have, what aperture value you have, what focus range you have. And you're going to see your depth of field expand and contract in real time as you change your aperture value. So I don't autofocus when I'm shooting landscapes because I don't have to. The camera's telling me the information right there. I don't know about you, Dave, but calculating hyperfocal distance uh, on newer cameras is almost impossible, right? And so with this setup, I can use that distance scale if it's set appropriately. There's two basis, basis I. <laughs> But uh, you have your film format basis and you have your pixel basis. So if you want mm -hmm. that to be tight, you got to be set to pixel basis because as we know, film in a smaller negative had more latitude in terms of it doesn't have to be as sharp because again, then it was acceptable sharpness. And when you go up to 100 megapixels, you need absolute sharpness. And so that's Chris, why have you, you have you been reading my blogs? No. No. Oh. That is perfect. That is, I came out with one two weeks ago, precisely about what you just stated, right? And that when you go to digital, digital, right? And then we increase our resolution, um, depth of field is, is acceptable sharpness. And what's acceptable at 50 megapixels is not acceptable at 100 megapixels, right? Because uh, it's, we now can define it better and, and our depth of field shrinks. And so importantly with focus peaking, can we trim it and calibrate it to what's focusing peaking that, that, that I want? Well, I mean, you got a high and a low, uh, mm -hmm. but for me, I find that I'm not reliant on focus peaking, and that's based on bad experiences from other manufacturers. Mm -hmm. I don't trust. Them. And so, if you like focus peaking, and you are a raw shooter, all you got to do is change the sharpness in camera. It's going to find those edges a little bit better because all it's doing is adding white around those edges to make those gray lines a little bit more defined. It's gonna help find those and focus peaking works slightly better. That's the same with every manufacturer. If you're a JPEG shooter, don't do that. That's gonna make your image look bad. But as a raw shooter, who cares what the screen looks like? It's about what's captured afterwards. And so I don't trust focus peaking that much and it has nothing to do with the camera. It's solely my personal preference. But John's absolutely right. If you're using our native lenses, Always put on autofocus plus manual focus override because it's going to make your life a lot easier. I just recommend turning off that punch in because you have that manual focus assist where it zooms in as soon as you hit that manual focus ring. I get lost. I'm a simple minded man. I don't want anything like that. <laughs> Christopher, should we mention some of the aspect ratios too? Because the GFX system is slightly different than the X series. You know, we have the, you know, the four to three to three to two, the one to one. And then we have the panorama fun. So if anybody's used to our older panoramic film seven. cameras, we do have that aspect ratio too. It's really great for uh, for landscape I try, stuff. I don't memorize all of them, but uh, yeah, you have one to one, four to three, sixteen by nine. Uh, let me go and in here. Where the one it is because I can never remember either. Hold on. And we uh, still have we still have four more questions to get to, gentlemen. Sixty-five by, by nine. 24. Yeah. And four by five, which I will be honest, I'm shooting more in four by five, but I'm not shooting in camera as a four by five aspect ratio. I'm using that in post. 
but I highly recommend if you want to do that in camera for compositional aid, shoot raw plus JPEG and you'll have the ability to use the different aspect ratios. If you shoot just raw, no aspect ratio choices whatsoever. You're stuck to four to three. And since you're talking about raw, you're actually telling me that the histogram is not using the raw data, it's using the JPEG data, correct? With every single camera in yeah. existence. <laughs> so how do we get past that? Mm -hmm. Well, we, we do offer something called natural live view. Natural live view strips the JPEG properties from the camera, and you're going to get a histogram that more closely reflects what the raw data is. It's not 100% because that's gonna be almost impossible, right? You're getting a live readout. But from my exp expertise in using this camera and these systems, at least the GFX series since launch, it's almost there. And so if you're using techniques called exposed to the right, you've gotta turn on natural live view because Velvi is gonna look different than Astia, that's gonna look different from ProNeg High or Standard because that adds contrast, saturation, and sharpness. And if I'm adding contrast to the scene, separates my histogram. And so you can set that to a function button, which is what I do. I don't use the LCD screens, they're nice, but I try to keep simple information there because I like to have my screen free of information other than autofocus points, unless I wanna cycle through to get to additional. And that's why you have the display back button on the rear of the camera. I can easily go from all the crap on the screen to nothing on the screen because there's nothing worse than getting home and realizing, oh crap, I cut into my, my subject because I, I don't care, dynamic range optimizer was in the corner and it was covering up that point, you know what I mean? And so that's huge for me. Dave, what else do we have? All right, um, another gentleman's asking, he's trying to do some stars uh, doing astrophotography and he's having you know, a problem with hyperfocal and in focusing on the LCD for the stars. So your recommendation for focusing on those would be direct, direct to affinity or what? Nah, oh my gosh. I mean, yeah, you can try to go directly to infinity, but as we know, these are all focused by wire. I mean, most lenses nowadays are. And so I recommend go to infinity to start off with, but keep in mind, you have the capability to punch in. And so by default, the rear rotary dial right here, if again, if you program your camera, it's not gonna be like this. If I punch that in, wherever I put that autofocus point, I'm gonna get a magnification. And now I can rotate this rear dial and I can zoom in more or zoom out less. That's how I do it. Because regardless of the system, it's gonna be really hard to focus on something like that, that far away. You know, when I shot Canon, I had to go, Focus all the way and slightly back, right? You hit that hard limit, then go back just slightly. It's not the same with this because they're now focused by wire. You can control what direction the focus ring goes. You can change whether it's linear or nonlinear. Is it based off speed? Is it based on how much? All of that can be programmed, and that's why we've gone to this style of lens. Right, exactly what we're looking for, and exactly what the name of this thing is, tips and tricks, so that's perfect. All right, three more questions we have. Okay. Uh, if you shoot in film standard mode and choose black and white film, if you're shooting raw, do you get black and white raw, or what comes out? Strips. Everything's stripped when you're shooting yeah. raw. So well, it's I nice highly those recommend... Go ahead, John. What I was going to say is in, in Capture One Lightroom and Photoshop, those film simulations are there, so you could just pick them out, whatever ones you want. So that's why I'm always in a raw Fuji plus JPEG. Studio also. So you can compose, basically you can compose your image, have Acros on there, or the, the monochrome option on there with whatever filters built in, and you could have your raw set up. So as soon as you import into Lightroom Capture One, whatever you guys are using, it's gonna be stripped, it's gonna be a color image. I mean, you're stripping all those JPEG properties, so that color information is still technically there, you're not getting that JPEG overlay anymore. Perfect. Uh, we've actually had this question in some of the questions before leading up to this, but when it comes to focus stacking, uh, recommendations or procedures or anything that we could touch on, and of course focus stacking could be a lot longer than than, than just a quick oh, question. Yeah. This camera, John, do you want to do this or do you want me to? Well, well, I'll start and then where I screw up, you take over. Yeah, you don't <laughs> screw up, man. Um, <laughs> the camera has two focus uh, focus bracketing features. Um, it's got their, your standard one with the, um, the number of frames, how many points you want to move the focusing point in between zero, one up to 10, depending on what you do and the intervals. But we also have an auto one on the X100, GFX100 where you could set your focusing points to the closest part of your image and to the furthest and the camera calculates 
everything else. But if you're shooting with raw and just say you're getting like a hundred shots for focus fracking, you try to stack that, at least my computer, I can't do it. It takes, because I did a class on focus and it was embarrassing because my computer locked up. You know? so, John, it looks like Fujifilm needs to buy you a new computer. <laughs> It's these cameras. Uh, so just to piggyback what uh, what John said, exactly. There's two modes. So you have your manual mode. You have basically the number of shots. You have the steps, and then you have the intervals between each shot. So the first one's obvious. My recommendation, if you're in manual option on this, just set it to 999. And the reason why is because you're going to determine the closest subject by rotating the lens, right? As soon as it hits infinity, it's gonna stop, whether it's 10 images or 998 images. So the next is gonna be that step. So that's the increment in which it changes focus. And I can't tell you an amount at all. And the reason why is it's because it's based off lens, it's based on your distance to your front subject, to your back subject. Just know that the lower the number is, the smaller the transition. So zero to maybe three might be good for macro. If I'm shooting landscapes, don't do zero or three. You're going to be shooting a lot of pictures. But I never use manual anymore on that. I always use auto, like John said. It makes life a lot easier. You determine your start point. You determine your end point. It does all the calculations for you. You hit the button, and it shows you your picture remaining. Yeah. And that's no all time done. At all. And that's all done on this portion of the camera here. Right through here, you just set it to multi, push the button, you could select either manual or autofocus bracketing, and then off you go. <laughs> yeah. Great, awesome. And then uh, I guess that's the last question here is, can you program your own custom aspect ratio size? I get that all the time, and it's been in my request for the last three years, uh, because I sure would like to have four to three aspect ratio on some of our other cameras, but no, I'm I'm sorry. You're gonna have to do the old-fashioned way and get some uh, get some uh, oh my gosh, gaffers tape and put it on your screen. I'm, I'm kidding, don't do that. But yeah. you kind of get the idea. And, and to John Gordon, um, what can you tell us the secrets that you, the the tech guys can't tell us about a, a 30 tilt shift lens coming out in the future out of 500 millimeter lens? Maybe the medium format box Fuji uh, film camera that's now a digital back portion that that you know is modular. What secrets can you tell us, Mr. Gordon? Oh boy, I wish I had the answers to those secrets, uh, but. Uh, Chris, Christopher might know, and John might know that answer. Oh, thanks, that thanks, John. I, I yeah. appreciate that. <laughs> um, Christopher, Christopher, yeah. before we, because I know we're getting close on time, should we chat one of the tricks? Should we talk about sending a lens to C and then using the front command dial to change your ISO and aperture? Sure, absolutely. Yeah. So on all of our GF lenses, there's the A for auto, and there's also a C here that's right here so what you could do is you set that and you can actually change your aperture i'm sorry this is horrible here by changing your using the front command i'll be changing your aperture and iso through here it's just another way to do it so you could just constantly do and just toggle back and forth between the aperture that's something i use all the time so like uh, like John has said, you know, with our other cameras, we traditionally did, you know, aperture, shutter speed, ISO on the exterior of the camera. The 50S is like this, the 50R is like this up to a certain point, but the GFX100 is not. And so all of our lenses have that C set up where you can basically command it from the body of the camera. Make it your own. Do you want the auto, do you want shutter speed on the front, the back? Do you want to control ISO on the front, the back? If I remember correctly, John, is it three functions you can set on the front dial? Yeah. So, I can mm -hmm. basically change almost anything from the front dial. You know, exposure comp, you know, I can change. Well, I don't need to go into the exposure triangle with you guys. You're you're talking about the GFX game. Yeah. Great. And so um for those people that want that 10% off coupon, Mr. Gordon will be sending us that 10% off coupon and, and I will forward that along and make sure it just to reach us. Can I get on that? Afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. It's in the mail. Let's see, another question here, um, pixel shifting, any possibility in the future of doing pixel shifting with it, I would uh, say. Pixel shift is in beta. There it you go. Really is. Yeah, it'll be out there eventually, don't know when, but it's, it's getting tested. So 400 megapixel equivalent, 
Yeah. It's already been announced, so I can tell you about it, but mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's in real life testing right now. Great. And so we'll, we'll try to find computers that can handle 400 megapixel files in 16 bit. Because mm -hmm. I'm not going to lie, my computer's dragging. Like yeah. John said, I, I don't do focus stacking with 100 pictures. <laughs> no, it's, it's, I really like to use mine with studio lighting. And I'm by no means a professional photographer at all, but I, I just what the results I get out of this and, and its predecessors too just blow me away. Just the colors and the clarity are just incredible. That's what sold me on it. Color yeah. is key. People say, well, it's raw. It doesn't matter, but yeah, it does. Well, one, I, one I last would question. Say that's Fuji's edge is color. One last question yes. what was a personal question whether I thought uh, a Lightroom or Capture One Pro or Photoshop did a better job. I'm, of course, I am a, a Capture One Pro guy, but regardless of Capture One Pro being something that's just second nature to us, um, I will tell you I have solved a lot of customers' problems with quality issues by switching them from Lightroom to, to Capture One. Now, I will also tell you, Capture One is not an archival, right? If you want to archive your system, it's horrible at it. Do yep. not use it for archiving. Do not use it in, in certain modes. But for, for, for processing edges and color and algorithms and noise, there's nothing compared to it. And it does an amazingly better job than Lightroom and, and all of our testing. And again, like I said, I've, I've solved problems with it. So gentlemen, we are at our time limit but um, I, I have to tell you not only was this informative I really enjoyed seeing you guys and the personality that Fujifilm brought to this and and seeing how open and, and sharing you you guys were I can't wait to have another one with with all of you so uh, John Gordon John Haggerty Christopher Gilbert thank you for your time today we appreciate it greatly thanks for having us thanks, thanks for having me it's definitely a privilege you're yeah. very welcome. And yeah. for all those people, if you're interested in getting a copy of this, we have it recorded and we'll be make that available to you and we can forward it. And so I think we're good. It's time for a drink. Oh, I'm there. All right, guys. <laughs> oh, all right. John, Cheers. there he is. <laughs> you guys are awesome. Have a great weekend. Everybody be safe out there. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.